Hello, this is Robert Dakota of Worldviews Media, and I'm so happy to be here with Randall Carlson. Thank you for joining us, Randall. My honor and my pleasure, Robert. For those who don't know who Randall is, I just want to read you a little bit of his bio. Randall Carlson is a master builder and architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geomythologist, geological explorer, and renegade scholar. He has four decades of study, research, and exploration into the interface between ancient mysteries and modern science. He has been an active Freemason for 40 years and is past master of one of the oldest and largest Masonic lodges in Georgia. He has been recognized by the National Science and Teachers Association for his commitment to science and education for young people. He has a whole list of other accolades. For example, in 1997, there was a CNN documentary, Fire from the Sky. Let's just take it from there, Randall. Uh, how I found out about you was uh, through Joe Rogan and Graham Hancock. And uh, before I had heard this Joe Rogan show with you on it, I, I had no idea that we were facing this uh, meteorological event twice a year and that basically it was similar to doing or playing Russian roulette with the universe. Can you tell us a little bit about how important that is each and every year? Well, that would be the torrid meteor shower that you're referring to, I'm guessing. Yes. Um, which um, is a large very old, very diffuse meteor stream that has subdivided into multiple streams, but all part of the same family. And goes back to an original progenitor comet that most likely entered the inner solar system between about 25 and 30,000 years ago. And at that point, it began to go in an orbit, an elliptical orbit between Jupiter and the sun. And as it's doing this dance between those two great gravitational fields, it's beginning to um, disintegrate, slowly disintegrate. And in fact, one of the, the phrases that has been used to describe the process is a hierarchy of disintegrations. So what it is, has done is it's created this the, the, this family of meteor streams that the Earth crosses twice each year. It crosses, now you've got a picture that in the case of a meteor stream, you'll have the stream coming in from space, like let's say from outside the Earth's orbit from Jupiter. It'll come in, it'll orbit the sun, and then it'll head back out towards Jupiter. The point where it passes closest to the sun is known as the perihelion point. Para means proximate to, and helium, of course, means the sun. So the stream comes in, and it's, it's a continuous stream, right? And it comes in, goes out to Jupiter, and comes back in. Within this stream, there are billions of meteors. There are several known asteroidal-type <laughs> events, uh, I mean, objects. And there's at least two cometary nuclei, um, Comet Rodnicki and Comet Anki, that are within that stream that were at one time all part of the same object, you see. So now in the, sum, in the summer, yes, in the summer, the Earth crosses the stream. Earth's, see, Earth's orbit and that meteor stream intersect each other. So in the summer, the Earth is crossing that stream as it's coming. It's already made its perihelion passage. It's coming from around the sun, and the Earth passes through the stream, as I said, it's a, it's a large and diffuse stream. So it takes close to a full week for the Earth to traverse the full width of this meteor stream. And this occurs in late June, early July of every year. Wow. Now fast forward to late October, early November, and the Earth crosses the stream again. Only this time, it's the stream as it's coming in from the sun, right? So... What happens is the torrid meteor stream, as it's coming in from the sun, the fall time uh, torrids, create a visible meteor shower. So if you go out late October, early November, and you face the constellation of the bull, Taurus, 
which gives its name to the stream. That's why it's called the torrid stream, because when you're looking at these approaching meteors coming from space, there's a point at which they appear to be emanating, right? It's, it's, it's a, a perspective effect. It's just like, I think everybody has walked down a railroad track at some time in their life, and you know how the, the rails seem to converge in the distance, right? Well, you have to almost imagine you're looking up a tunnel that's converging in the distance, and these meteors are flying down this tunnel. Well, as the points, as you go upstream, those points converge onto the radiant, the radiant point, it's called. And that radiant point is centered on the shoulder of the bull, very close to the Pleiades, right? And so because of the fact that the point in space from which the meteors appear to be emanating is Taurus, the stream is called the Torrid meteor stream. Likewise, if you're talking about the Leonid meteors, it's because the radiant point appears to be on Leo or the Geminids. So now you're looking towards the constellation Gemini. Is that all making sense? Yeah. Yeah, good. Now, the significance of that is, is that Within that stream, there are undoubtedly hundreds, if not thousands, of objects that have not yet been discovered that could cause serious problems if they were to impact the Earth. Now, an example of an object that most likely was a member of the Torrid meteor stream was the Tunguska object that blew up over Siberia in 1908. If you recall, the date of that event was June 30th, right? Which is right at the peak of the Torrid meteor stream, right? The, the, right? the Earth crossing the stream. Secondly, based upon eyewitness accounts, uh, astronomers are able to reconstruct the position from which it emerged out of the sky. And guess what? It's the radiant point of the Torrid meteor stream, uh, the summertime Torrids. In other words, you got a picture of the sun and that stream is coming around the sun. We're crossing it. And it was because of the fact of the, the proximity of the stream to the direction of the sun that many of the eyewitnesses made comments like, uh, for example, that it looked like the, the, the object when they saw it in the sky, that it was uh, coming out of the sun. It was being born out of the sun, right? So, in other words, if it had come from the other side of the sky, we'd say, well, it, even if it was at the June 30th, the right time of the year, it's not coming from the right place in the sky to be a member of the Torrid meteor stream. However, the date is, is right on and the position in space from which you would expect to see a summertime Torrid emerging from the sky is right on. So it's either just a, 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 a coincidence but it's more likely that that object was a member of the Torrid system. Now, that object itself is estimated to have been about 50 meters in diameter, maybe 150 or 160 <sighs> feet. So it's, it's, by cosmic standards, it's not big at all. It's, right. right. When that thing exploded, it, see, and, and here's another point that is important for people to realize, is that it did not, like many of the denser objects, meteors, it did not strike the ground. It, it blew up five miles or so up in the atmosphere, right? You got to bear in mind that this thing is moving so fast, it might be moving at 20 miles per second. Given that the atmosphere is eight miles thick, you can see that it could traverse the entire depth of the atmosphere in a matter of seconds, but, or, or a half a second. But it came in at an oblique angle. So if, if it was coming in perpendicular, then, you know, it's roughly eight miles of atmosphere. It came in at an oblique angle, so it, it, it was slowing down. And that's one reason that people actually saw the thing, the track of the thing as it's coming across the sky for a long distance, right? Before it finally, it's still moving fast enough that the, that the atmosphere can't get out of the way in time. So that atmosphere is compressing. It's piling up in front of it. And at some point, it reaches a threshold, and it's literally like the object hits up a brick wall. When it does that, boom, it just sort of turns inside out and releases all of this energy into the atmosphere in the form of this gigantic explosion, which is estimated to have been roughly equivalent force to the uh, a large hydrogen bomb, 
which would be about 15 to 20 megatons, which would be enough to annihilate any large city on Earth, totally. Um, but luckily, it was up in Siberia, and it was in a very remote area. So there were probably a few, maybe, maybe some uh, reindeer herders who might have been killed, but nobody knows for sure. There were no documented immediate deaths. Now, in the aftermath of the event, several people did die. Um, but this was like prolonged. There was like some people who were too close to the epicenter when this explosion happened, for example, went deaf. Others were hurled 20 and 30 feet through the air and, and you know, maybe slammed into trees and suffered injuries that then they later succumbed to. But when the thing exploded, the blast wave came down. When it hit the earth, the pressure wave, it's, it's blowing up over old growth Taiga forest. So when that blast wave hits the forest, it just flattens it, flattens it in every direction. And for 15 to 20 miles in every direction. So the total area of devastated forest was a, roughly about 820 square miles. And about 200 miles, square miles, directly under the epicenter was completely incinerated. Wow. Okay, so what that does is I think that the Tunguska object really, that event was a very important cosmic lesson because it showed us what's possible. And, you know, you cannot extrapolate from that one event and say, okay, well, we can say that an event like that happens every 10,000 years or 1,000 years or 100,000 years. We have to have multiple events. Now, most of the estimates as to the um, uh, frequency of such an event were based upon older assumptions, what we knew 30 and 40 years ago, right? Now, bear in mind that when this event happened, no scientist, this happened in 1908, no scientist got to the site until 1927. So wow. there was no, there was no actual, and, and, and talk about a heroic tale, when Leonid Kulik, was the scientist who got there. And it was a, a definitely a hero's journey to get to this remote place and to find this area of, of total devastation, which um, he found to be uh, completely disorienting and unnerving when he went and finally crests this ridge and he looks out and as far as the eye could see, these great three foot thick trees are just splayed out like they're matchsticks or something. And, um, he found it very, very disturbing, uh, in effect. And um, the area, the, the local Tungusis that lived there, they believed that it was cursed. They would not go into there. So he had, he had a lot of trouble finding a guide that would take him to the place um, because they were, they were afraid of the thing. They, they said that this is where Agdi, the fire god, descended to earth. And so... Uh, but the significance of that is that in the interim now, we've learned some things that would suggest that events like that happen considerably more frequent than was assumed 30 and 40 years ago. And then we had a little reminder of that back in 2014 with the Chelyabinsk meteor that exploded over the town of the same name. Uh, didn't kill anybody, but there were hundreds of injuries and, and maybe 1,000 or 1,500 buildings suffered damage. Now, if that, if that object had been just a little bit larger, or its angle of descent had been a little steeper, or its density had been a little bit greater, it could have penetrated farther into the atmosphere than it did when it and exploded. And you might have had 1,000 or 2,000 people instantly killed, another three or four or 5,000 people injured buildings flattened and that would have certainly got the world's attention already Chelyabinsk has more or less been forgotten within the right. you know the, the the area of 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 attention the attention span of most people on earth but I think we have to look at events like that because we've we've discovered two things uh in the last let's say 20 to 25 to 30 years is that two things you've got two branches of science. You've got geologists who are looking at the rocks, the earth, the ground beneath our feet, that which is below. You've got astronomers looking out into the celestial vault, 
the sky over our heads, that which is above. Geologists looking at the world real, are realizing, beginning to realize, and I've been doing my damnedest for the last 25 years to get this idea, this, this understanding out there, that this planet we inhabit bears tremendous scarring from a whole, you know, countless disasters and catastrophes that have engulfed this planet over and over again, right? Amongst these scars, and probably the ultimate driver of a lot of the catastrophes in Earth history, are the great impacts. Things from space striking the Earth, creating craters and astrobleams, which are essentially great scars in the, the Cambria, the, the, the lithostratigraphic Cambria of the Earth, if you want to look at it that way. And we've seen that the last 75 years or 80 years roughly since the early 20th century, if we go back, at one point there was one recognized crater, the uh, famous meteor crater just uh, to the east of Winslow, believe it, to the east of Winslow, Arizona. Yeah. You know, um, and meteor crater. Well, now there's several hundred. And of the several hundred that have been identified, that's probably only 10%. But of, of, because what happens, unlike the moon, which is sort of the Rosetta Stone, if you will, of cosmic catastrophe, because if you look at the surface of the moon, you see that the entire surface of the moon is pockmarked with hundreds of thousands of craters. And when you, you include the little ones, even millions of craters. So the moon bears the scars of all of these great impacts that have happened over and over and over again. In fact, we've even now had the opportunity to witness impacts. In 1976, we witnessed a series of impacts on the surface of the moon not long after some of the first moon sensors and seismometers were in place in the uh, post-Apollo era. And guess what? When do you think that stream of objects hit the moon? Late June. And to think of where it came from? Right from the direction that it needed to be to be a member of the Torrid stream. So geologists are looking beneath our feet and discovering that the Earth bears witness to a whole series of these tremendous events that have, that have occurred throughout Earth history, right? Far more than, than, than we've already been able to count if we're just doing crater counting. Now, on the other hand, astronomers are looking out into space and discovering that um, there's a lot denser population of stuff out there in near-Earth space than anybody was imagining 30 and 40 and 50 years ago. I mean, 50 years ago, before the era, the satellite era, we were just beginning to understand that there are these objects out there flying randomly, sometimes through the solar system, other times in this ping pong match between the sun and Jupiter. And so what you've got now, and, and even as we speak, Robert, within the last month or two, we've already had half a dozen near flybys. These things are flying, we're seeing things flying by the earth now typically at least once or twice or more a month, right? Wow. This is nothing like we were seeing 30, 40, 50 years ago. We had no idea. Now, the question, and to me, this is the key question here. When we see these things flying by the earth, and I think we, we had some near flybys on Christmas Day. We've had, I think, three subsequent to Christmas now. When we're seeing these things, here's, here's the question that, that we need to uh, raise. And that is, are we, is this the normal flux of these things? And we're just better at, at discovering them and seeing them? Or is the flux of extraterrestrial objects actually increasing? See, that's, a, that's an important question that we don't know the answer to yet. But so what has happened is if we look back at the very beginning of geology, the, the, the founding of geology back in the early 19th century, and we look at those, those gentlemen who before there existed the academic discipline of geology, and you have these gentlemen like uh, Cuvier and, and Sedgwick and Roder Roderick Murchison and William Buckland and, and, and probably half a dozen others that were going out and observing the landscapes around them 
and trying to decipher what they were seeing. And to a man, they all believed they were seeing evidence of great catastrophes, right? This was like their first initial unbiased impression when they're looking at, at things. Um, when they're looking at some of the canyons, when they're looking at some of the overthrusting rocks of, uh, you know, where you have maybe a thousand foot thick slab of rock that's been thrust up over another one, the kind you can see up in the Canadian Rockies so readily, or, or in, in, the, in the Swiss Alps, you, you see the same thing. They can, or when they would see these tremendously huge gravel deposits and they would go, how did these gravel deposits get here? Now, two things happened. One, you had the, the, the discovery of the, grace, the glacial cycles with um, primarily with the work of Louis Agassiz, post-Civil War, which became kind of accepted because what happened was, interestingly, the birth of modern science coincided with the end of the Little Ice Age. So when you had these early natural philosophers, as they were called, going out and observing the landscapes, what they were doing, they were also seeing some pretty substantial changes that were going on, climatic changes, because the three to 400 years of the Little Ice Age was now ameliorating. So they were able to directly see from season to season and from year to year, the glaciers retracting back. So as the glaciers retracted back, they were able to observe and analyze, investigate the uh, landscape evidence that's left behind in the wake of, of the disappearance of the glaciers. Because here's what you have to understand is that during the Little Ice Age, starting in around uh, the mid-1300s, uh, going through a couple of cycles, ending in about the mid-1800s. But during that time, the glaciers worldwide reached their largest extent that they had been literally in about 10,000 years. So to find glaciers that were bigger than those of the Little Ice Age, you have to go back into the Great Ice Age, right? But here's the thing, Robert. The Little Ice Age... The, the geomorphic work that it did on the landscapes, primarily now we're looking at, at Europe, but then not long after that, America as well. The geomorphic work that it did was an analog, but a smaller version of what the great ice sheets had done. So when these guys are literally seeing from year to year, the ice sheets contracting, and they're seeing the erratic boulders that are left behind, when they're seeing... <laughs> layers of crushed and broken rock that we basically we call till because as the glaciers are moving over the landscape they're they're bulldozing it up and they're tearing that material up and they're grinding it and rolling it and this it's it leaves this chaotic mess of 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 boulders and cobbles and gravel and sand and silt and organic material all mingled together chaotically without structure without sorting right the difference is if, if there's sorting and structure, that's water deposition. If it's, un, if it's chaotic, this is the aftermath of, of glaciers. But so these gentlemen are out there, they're seeing this, they're seeing the glaciers retract, they're seeing the types of, of pro-glacial streams and rivers that are flowing off and how they erode and create uh, terraces. They're seeing how they shape the glacial till, as it's called, the, the, the broken rock, into moraines, right? So you picture the, the glacier comes down and it's lobate. It's, it's like a tongue, a big tongue. It comes down the valley out of the mountains and it's piling this material up in front of it, right? Now, if you picture it's lobate, if it's tongue shaped, now at the snout of this glacier, you've got this mound of this material that's been shoveled up right? It might be 50 feet thick. It could be 200 or 300 feet thick, right? Now, the glaciers begin to melt back and retract. The moraine stays behind. So they're able to see that, right? So for example, over in Europe, at the foothills of the Alps, they see the Little Ice Age glaciers retreating back and leaving um, terminal moraines, moraines that formed at the, at the snout of the glaciers, right? If you have two glaciers coming down out of contiguous valleys and they come down and they join, uh, as, as those glaciers are moving through the mountain valleys, they're scraping the sides of the mountains, right? That's why you get these U-shaped valleys. They're scraping the sides of the mountain and they're incorporating all of that material that's being 
gouged off the flanks of the mountains into the glaciers, right? So that forms lateral moraine. So you've got lateral moraine, which is on the sides of the glaciers. You've got terminal moraine, which is at the end of the glaciers. So my point in all of this is they were able to observe this firsthand. So now you see all of this going on. And like I said, they're looking here in the foothills of the Alps. Now, 20 and 30 miles away, they're looking and there's these massive terminal moorings that are just like what they've just seen formed, but on a bigger scale. And the, the lithology or the rocks of that are the same rocks that you would find in the Alps, see? But not the rocks you would find in the much smaller Jura Mountains. So they put two and two together and they realize that, whoa, at some time in the past, you had these really monstrous glaciers that had extended 20 and 30 miles beyond the Little Ice Age glaciers, which were already enough to freak everybody out because these Little Ice Age glaciers were coming down and wiping out farms and villages. And, and you know, a lot of the, the inclement weather that was associated with the Little Ice Age, you know, basically got superstitious people so freaked out that they they blamed some of this the, the the inclement weather and the cold which brought crop failures in its wake which of course crop failures because if you've got no transportation network and you don't have a way of getting food in crop failures mean people don't eat so now you have famine and when you have famine and people don't eat their immune systems get weak right now when people's resistance to various diseases get weak. Now that's when you have, when you have um, pestilence, right? So all of these things kind of fit together. And then the response was amongst the superstitious, superstitious and uneducated masses was, this was the handiwork of witches and devil worshipers. So a lot of the pogroms of burning witches during the middle ages was a direct result of people's reaction to the decline of climate that occurred with the little ice age. But the point is, is that they were able to look at this, what was going on immediately in their environment during the time that they were observing and extrapolate from that to this much bigger episode and come to recognize the Great Ice Age. See? So um, that's the significance. Of, and, and what that did then, Robert, is it led to what was called, is still called the uniformitarian principle looking at stuff that's going on now, extrapolating from that to, to understand what happened in the past, right? And it's a very powerful diagnostic methodology where you can look at things that are, for example, you might look at how a river is eroding its banks and carrying sediment and depositing that sediment, right? And, and it creates a very distinct suite of landforms. And, and from that, you can then extrapolate and, and say, ah, yes, well, here we see the same landform, except it might have existed 10 million years ago. And it's now basically, you know, buried under and but we can still discover it by various means, direct or indirect. So what happened then is at the beginning of geology, the science of geology, when it was being first formulated into a system, is that you had these guys going, wow, there was great catastrophes in Earth history. Several of these guys, like um, Adam Sedgwick, he was a theologian. I think Murchison was too. One of the things he would do is he would go out and he would make his rounds as a country minister. And at the same time, he's traveling the country in England now. He's looking. He's, he's a very keen observer of the landscapes around him. So he was like, you know, seeing this stuff. And later on, the critics came to think, and because in some cases it was true, when they were seeing these deposits that were typically glacial deposits, they, the first term, we call it till now, but the original term was drift. Because the idea was, if you think of drift, something drifting, you think of water transport, don't you? Yeah. So they were looking at this stuff and going, they called it drift, believed it was evidence for great floods. And then, of course, you know, early to mid-19th century, you to start talking about a great flood, then what, what does that invoke? Noah. Right? Noah, <laughs> exactly. So, so what happened then was, you know, we're, we're shifting away from the, the 
young earth conventions that, and dogmas of the Middle Ages and into uh, the 18th and 19th centuries when, for a number of reasons, you know, scientists began to realize that the earth was way, way older than six or 7,000 years, right? So for a while there, in the early days of science, you had this conflict between the young earth group which were theologically based and biblically based and the scientific group that was empirically based and observationally based, right? Well, eventually the, the observational group won out because clearly, I mean, I think anybody who studies geology, except for, you know, if you're truly a committed evangelical Christian and, and you, you, you take your, um, your models of reality straight out of the Bible, you know that the that you know when you start studying the strata and you real you look at uh, the strata and you see a whole succession of totally alternate environments changing that you might have uh, you know shallow marine environment creating limestone and then you'll have a a swampy environment creating a sh shale bedrock and then you have a desert environment and a succession of these things then you may have a layer of lava and then another m marine environment and you look at these and there's a hundred layers like that you're going no there ain't no way that this is six thousand years oh and then you find a forest <laughs> there you go and then and then on top of the forest is a layer of limestone so you go okay this must have been a forest growing near the ocean but the ocean rose deposited you know was there for however long that you could create you know, three or four or 500 foot thick layer of limestone and then the ocean receded and now there's sand because it was a beach and then another layer of forest. See, so I mean, you start going through that and you realize ain't no way, man, there ain't, ain't no way the, the earth is 6,000 years old. But so what happened is you had this conflict now between, you know, the, the scientific worldview and the, and the, the biblical worldview. And eventually, the, the the scientific worldview prevailed, right? In in at least in the in the uh, halls of academia. Well, what happened was as a result of this, and it was a pretty pretty rigorous conflict or controversy between these different viewpoints of world history. It was the, the it was a a, a a battle that was hard won, right? By the by the scientific side, so they were very reluctant to go, okay, and accept, okay, this evidence might be evidence that there was a great flood because, oh, now you're bringing us back to biblical literalism. <laughs> so in a way, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. And by the time you get to the 1890s and into the early 1900s now, geology has become solidified as an academic discipline that is now being taught in universities. See, 50 years before, in the days of Cuvier, and, and it was natural philosophy, but it was not geology per se, right? By the early uh, 1900s, it had, the system had become codified, you know, by looking at the chronostratigraphy of the, the rock layers and the dating of the fossils and everything, and a whole system was emerging, right, of geological eons and, and, uh, and periods and epochs and so on, right? So what you see is that gradualism, the idea that changes accumulated slowly and incrementally be, had totally dominated the thinking about earth history by the time you get to the year 1900. And <clears throat> this was <clears throat> comp, uh, accompanied by and complemented by the rise of Darwinism, which also was predicated upon the idea of very slow incremental changes over many, many generations. See, So in effect, geological uniformitarianism and biological Darwinism sort of were, were, were mutually reinforcing each other, you see. And so any talk of catastrophism in the early 1900s was considered anathema. You're trying to take us back to biblical literalism. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, we, We've done that. We've been there, done that. Go away. Right. So then when J. Harlan Bretz comes along in the 1920s and came up with this rigorously documented evidence of these gigantic floods out in the Pacific Northwestern of the United States, primarily Eastern Washington. They were like, nah, go away. We don't want to hear about that. <laughs> so in effect though, Robert, we've kind of come full cycle because 
strict gradualism certainly dominated um, geological science throughout the 20th century, um, with some exceptions. There were certainly important exceptions, J. Harlan Bretz being one of them with the, with the channel discovery of the channel scablands. There were others, certainly by the 50s and 60s, there were some, you know, fringe characters that were actually going, talking about, you know, impacts of things from space. But they were so out there, in, they, they were the outliers, and they could easily be ignored, right? But here comes 1980. What happens in 1980? You've got the Luis Alvarez team and several other teams independently in that year published at least three, maybe four papers, suggesting variants on the idea that Earth got struck by, um, was impacted by something from space. This happened, and in, in, in the context of the sudden rapid extinction of the dinosaurs, which had been an ongoing mystery for decades. And as our ability to uh, date things more precisely um, improved from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, it became apparent that the, that the demise of the dinosaurs happened very rapidly. So by 1980, you now have the, 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 the idea suddenly going mainstream that um, Earth had been struck by this great asteroid or comet. One of the variations of it was a comet. I think now the consensus is it was probably a, a, an asteroid about six or seven miles in diameter. Wow. I think, yeah, that struck what is now the Yucatan Peninsula, basically the northern end of the Yucatan Peninsula. There's a ring of cenotes that, that, that defines the southern half of this great sunken astrobleam. Um, about 130 miles in diameter. Now, there's also evidence that there was actually a clustered period of bombardment. This was probably the greatest, but there were there's evidence that there may have been as many as a dozen other impacts in a short interval of time, maybe over 100,000 years. So it may be that the dinosaurs were not terminated in one fell swoop, there may have been several smaller impacts before the great impact. And then that great impact though was utterly devastating to the, to the planetary biosphere. Um, some studies by geophysicists, which suggest that an impact of an object that large moving that fast could cause essentially every fault line on the planet to fail it would probably wow. trigger, trigger, um, uh, you know, seismic seismicity that could be, uh, measured at 10 to 11 on the Richter scale. Uh, it created huge tsunamis. It set off global firestorms. It, in the immediate aftermath, there was a cosmic winter that enshrouded the earth because of the uh, sheer volume of material that was injected into the atmosphere. Um, the amount of soot and particulate matter would have been so dense for the first couple of years that large parts of the planet would have been shrouded in complete darkness. Then the cold would have come in that would have killed plant life that that managed to survive the initial impact and then you had the sulfate aerosols and 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 other um volatile materials injected into the atmosphere that would um form acid rain very intense acid rain several studies suggest that uh there were huge torrential rainstorms uh with a ph of 1 so wow. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, you're talking battery acid there. So, yeah, yeah it, it was hell on earth for a while. And w when you begin to go through the the literature and you begin to understand the the the, the severity and the extent of this uh, phenomena, the the question was, how in the hell did anything survive? But um, stuff did. Um, and by clearing out the dinosaurs, it gave way for mammals to rise to dominance. But anyway, so. Getting back to 1980, the idea there is that it, that was where the door began to open to an acceptable, um, you know, understanding of catastrophism. Now, as a result of that, now by 1980, there had been at least four or five other great extinction episodes in Earth history where, you know, the, the, the paleontologists are looking at the rock strata and they're seeing you know, going back to the late Ordovician, and they're seeing all of these really interesting, cool marine creatures, you know, just abundant in the rocks, and then all of a sudden they're gone, right? What happened? 
right? And they're looking in various places around the planet, finding the same thing. Then late Devonian, same thing, you know, um, Permian Triassic, same thing. Perhaps 90 to 95% of all marine creatures at the end of the Permian uh, period went extinct. And then you had the, 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 um, the Triassic, Jurassic boundary, same thing. Then the Cretaceous tertiary. Um, so these were the, the great five in Earth history. And so these had, had been identified by 1980. And as the 80s progressed, the, the, the main question was, <clears throat> what are the causes of this? What is, what is driving these sudden decimation of, of, you know, huge numbers of species, right? And leaving these impoverished biosphere, the, an impoverished biosphere that then might take tens of thousands of years before it actually begins to recover. So obviously with the KT, the Cretaceous tertiary, which is now dated to around 66 million years ago, we've got the evidence of the great asteroid impact. But we've also got know that there was a, one of the huge volcanic outpourings of highly acidic lavas or magmas occurred precisely at that time as well, the Deccan Traps of India. If we go back to 241 million years ago, we find uh, the Siberian Traps, um, same thing, these massive outpourings of lava, in some cases miles thick, um, you know, layer upon layer. If we go to the Triassic Jurassic, again, we find the same thing. We find the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province um, that now can be found remnants of it flanking both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, a huge outpouring of lavas. We also find traces of extraterrestrial impact, like, for example, iridium, which is, uh, and platinum or osmium as well. These are these are elements that are abundant in asteroids and meteorites, but rare in the uh, rocky crust of the Earth. So this was how, this was the first clue that led the geologists to the realization that there had been an extraterrestrial impact at the KT boundary 66 million years ago was the discovery of this spike of iridium. The first place they found it was a, was a, a, a KT outcrop in Italy. Subsequently, they found another one in Denmark, another one in New Zealand, and then within a few years, over 50 sites around the planet at that boundary, at that 66 million year old stratigraphic boundary, here you have this huge iridium spike. Well, knowing that iridium is delivered to Earth via meteors and asteroids, there we go. That was the first hint. Then in 19, early 1990s, the discovery of the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan confirmed. Well, so now the question is, as we go back and we look at the other great five and we see that We've got evidence both of extraterrestrial impact and huge volcanism happening simultaneously. And I think it's very probable, and it's been suggested, this is not an original idea with me, that the volcanism may be a result, maybe a consequence of the impact, see, that the impact so destabilizes uh, the earth right down into the mantle. And it may be a consequence because, interestingly, the Deccan, the, 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 the region of, of outpouring magma of the Deccan traps is in India, and it was at the antipode or the opposite side of the earth from the Chicxulub impact. So it has been proposed that perhaps there was essentially like a seismic wave that moved out from the impact around the whole planet and then converged on the opposite side of the planet, and that's where the volcanism burst out. And now for the next several million years, it's just like this bleeding wound, right? And at the same time it's doing that, it's dumping all of this highly volatile material into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, let's bring it home. Because what happened was, you now get to the 20th, 20, yeah, the 21st century, right? The early 2000s. By this time now, it's pretty much now accepted by mainstream academia that great catastrophes have played a role in Earth history. Where we're at now, though, is the recognition that, yeah, we can, we can bring it closer to home than that. I mean, as long as the last great global catastrophe happened 66 million years ago, well, it's certainly of academic interest, but it's not of immediate concern to you know, the future of our own civilization. 
But where we're at now is realizing that there are, when you start looking at the smaller scale events, like the idea of a six mile asteroid striking the earth <laughs> anytime in the near future is very, very unlikely, right? However, however, see, here's the, here, here's the point. You can get much smaller than that. You know, just a fraction of something like that could be enough to cause severe disruptions to civilization, severe disruptions. I mean, if you had an object that was, say, Tunguska, like I said, was about 150 feet in diameter. Suppose you had an object that was maybe 10 to 20 times the mass of Tunguska. Or let's say Earth actually encountered a swarm of objects similar in scale to Tunguska, right? We're seeing that there are a lot of different possibilities people weren't even considering a generation or two ago, see? <laughs> and we're realizing <clears throat> with, with A, the evidence of the, the, the land under us, which bears witness to repeated catastrophes on all scales, and then we see the cosmic realm in which our Earth is immersed, and we're seeing that it's abundantly populated with stuff, and it's constantly making close flybys to the Earth, coming in, you know, inside the orbit of the moon, just outside the orbit of the moon, you know, flying, uh, you know, stuff that is not causing fear from the standpoint that it might immediately hit us. You know, I mean, if we see something and it's a million miles away, well, hey, yeah, okay, we're not going to worry about that. But here's the problem is we're now seeing that stuff constantly flying by out there. And, and at the same time, now we get back to this, and it was one of your questions about the importance of mythology. Because... See, until recent times, it was assumed that mythology was essentially just, and, and you'll see this in textbooks and stuff. Well, these people, they were ignorant. They were, they were, you know, scientifically illiterate. So they had to invent these wild <laughs> tales to, to somehow make sense out of this big, uh, you know, nature that they didn't understand and that they would concoct these tales because, you know, it was just a way to ameliorate the fear factor of, of the unknown, but not the idea that behind these myths, and even if the myths had been embellished or had been used as vehicles to, to piggyback moral or ethical uh, teachings upon, regardless of that, it, it underlying at the basis of these myths were real events. You see, that behind, underneath Noah's art story might be a real event, right? There may have been a, a very real uh, possibility of a major catastrophic flood in the Middle East, you know, maybe 6,000 years ago. There's evidence, not, not proven yet, but evidence of a major impact into the Indian Ocean and huge tsunamis that would have swept up the Arabian Sea into the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, and swept right up and, and wiped out the seven cities of, of Samaria, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and we can begin to go down the, the list of myths, and we find in every culture there are stories of great floods and great disasters yep. and, you know, uh, uh, wars in the heavens between the gods and, 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 yeah, fire from the sky and on and on. Well, Listen, see, here's the thing. We better not be so damn arrogant that we're going to just dismiss all that because, see, that's when you get to the term, people go, Carlson, he's a geomythologist. What's that? You know, well, I'll tell you, what a geomythologist <laughs> does, and it is actually a, a emerging sci a valid scientific discipline that actually now knows that you can go into the, the, this great heritage of, of mankind, the mythic heritage of mankind, and extract legitimate scientific information and insight. And, and what it tells us, of course, is that, you know, just as species become extinct during the great mass extinction events, right? Now, the record of history of civilization on Earth is that, yeah, now, just like species go extinct in cat catastrophic events, civilizations go extinct. And, they, and, and, and the moral teachings basically all come down to kind of more or less the same variance, same variation, which is that they were not prepared. They were not paying attention. There was signs in the heavens that were ignored, typically. 
And as a result of the fact of blotting out the greater reality of which we were a part, we suffered the consequences. So I think there was that, um, I think it was in the book of Matthew, not to, not to try to bring in, you know, that, that I'm trying to cast all this in a biblical framework, but I could, I could quote from any number of ancient works. I'll just pick the Bible because it's so readily part of our Western culture, but in the book of Matthew, one of the disciples, and I forgot which one, asked Jesus, well, when are we going to know when the end times are here, the end of days? And if you read the book of Matthew or you read the book of Revelations, of course, and you, you now know about this, this uh, the process of, of cosmic bombardment, you go, okay, go read, go read the, the eyewitness accounts of, of uh, the Tunguska event, right? Then go read some of the biblical accounts in the, in the apocalypse of St. John, right? Same type of language, same, I mean, this, the, the, the imagery is so parallel and strikingly similar that you go, wait a minute, maybe behind all of this, the, there were people who witnessed something like this and were so impressed, just like the Tungusi tribesmen, and came up with a whole new religion based upon Agdi, the, the fire god descending from the sky. It made, you know, it's not far-fetched to assume that an event, let's say, tenfold or a hundredfold more extreme than Tunguska would spawn traditions that would persist for thousands of years, right? So I think that's, the, that's where we're at now. We have to begin to realize that we have this legacy, this tradition that's been handed down to us, and it's not um, just to be dismissed um, as being, you know, the ravings of pre-scientific illiterates, that it might actually be you know, based upon eyewitness accounts of real historical events, and that um, we have been blessed for the last few centuries with a period of relative calm, uh, and there is absolutely no reason to assume that there's not going to be catastrophes in the future. The question is, are we going to be prepared? Now, getting back to the quote in Matthew, when the disciple asked Jesus, how will we know? And he says, well, he says, as it was, or what will be, what will be the conditions when, you know, when the return occurs? What's this return referring to? But he says, well, as it was in the days of Noah, when the people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the flood came and swept them all away, so will it be again, right? Now, He's not saying that there's anything wrong with people eating or drinking or marrying or giving in marriage. His point is, yeah. just like when the Hopis said, well, the catastrophe came when humans failed to recognize the plan of the creator, the heavenly plan, the celestial plan, right? It's kind yeah. of the same idea that if we fail to look at the big picture and acknowledge the larger framework of which we are a part that's when we become vulnerable we have it within our grasp now it was like david levy who said you know if we look at the co-discoverer of, of comet shoemaker levy nine back in in 90, 93 94 comets named after him right he said you know if you look at all the natural disasters that have that have befallen humanity you know from hurricanes to great earthquakes to great floods to great fires you know at this point or you know volcanic eruptions at this point we can't do much about a hurricane we can't do much about a volcanic eruption he says but you know the impact events encompass all of them because one great impact event you're going to have every one of the other ones you're going to have the volcanism the hurricanes the fires the earthquakes you're going to have all of those right but he says and this was his key point. He says, now, we can't do anything about, really, at this point, about a hurricane or a, a tsunami, but we can do something about the next impact. When we discover that bolide out there, that asteroid that has our name on it, our number on it, if we have enough lead time, yeah, we can do something about it. And see, this is the thing. If we go back to the Garden of Eden, let's say that the whole planet becomes just a permaculture garden. We go totally green. We divest of fossil fuels. You know, we, 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 we are living basically, you know, like some people are proposing we should live in order to save the earth. Well, the, the irony there is, is that we have now rendered ourselves completely vulnerable.
we are, first of all, because of we've got technology in place, we are now able to see these denizens of the deep that could potentially um, impact the earth, right? A um, hundred years ago, you know, we were just really beginning. You know, well, I mean, telescopes have been around since the 16, 1700s, but we haven't had the ability to track things like, you know, that we've got now. Um, so the key here is that, you know, a small object, a Tunguska object is going to be hard to track. Now, a Tunguska object is going to come in. Let's say that that object from, from, from 1908 came in over the eastern seaboard, right? What's going to happen? Well, you're going to have a million casualties easily. You're going to have a million. It, it's it's going to be like dropping a hydrogen bomb. Now, there are, there are um, very rigorous scientific models out there developed by astronomers and astrophysicists, primarily in Britain, but in Australia and several Americans who've been working together on this for 30 years, that would suggest that there are times where there is multiple impact events simultaneously. And, and here's the thing, you gotta understand, Robert, when we do crater counting, Crater counting is going to tell us the big impacts. You know, if you've got a mile wide or even a half mile wide object comes in and smacks into the earth, gouges this big old hole, leaves this massive scar, and it now going to take long, long time for that to get obscured, right? Um, eventually it will, presumably because of subduction and plate tectonics and weathering and uh, all of that. And, and so like the Chicxulub crater that's buried under half a mile of limestone. We were drilling for oil. Pemex oil in, in Mexico was drilling for oil. And they drilled down through this half layer of, half mile layer of limestone and they hit this vitrified rock. Their first impression was that it was, that it was uh, volcanic, but because of the, the nature and the composition of it, it didn't, once they looked at it closer, it didn't look like volcanic. And then you have this ring of the cenotes, the sinkholes that were, you know, the sacred wells of the Mayans that almost perfectly defined the southern arc of this great circular buried structure, right? So we've got the discoveries that these things are all around us. They've, they've left their scars in the earth, right? And we can now count them. But now we look at the Tunguska object, right? It didn't leave one of those big classic bowl-shaped holes in the ground. It blew down a lot of trees. And so if we get there a decade or two decades or 50 years later, we can see the trees blown down. We can discover that there are some subdued effects in the landscape. But a thousand years later, when the forests have completely recovered, we wouldn't know. Yeah. Now, here's the, here's the thing. When we begin to look at the composition and identity of these uh, denizens of the deep, as I like to call them, we discover that the denser objects, on one end of the continuum, you've got really dense objects that are about the same as almost cast iron. On the other end of the, the spectrum, you've got cometary masses that are maybe not much more than a gram per cubic centimeter, almost like frozen water, almost like an ice ball, a dirty ice ball or a icy dirt ball. In between, you've got a range of stony objects, right? The really low density objects have to be really big before they actually hit the ground and, and leave that, that scar there for, you know, scientists to come there thousands of years later or hundreds of thousands of years later and, and, and investigate. On the other end, a very small iron object can reach the surface of the earth and, and plow a hole. Like the object that left the, the, the 600 foot deep crater in Arizona, kilometer wide, about 32, 3,300 feet wide, 600 feet deep. That was an object that was maybe about the same size as Tunguska, maybe 100 to 150 feet, but it's an iron object. We know it was an iron object because they found pieces of it, right? Yeah. So, it was an iron object, struck the earth, dug a hole, right? Tunguska did not, right? Now, here's the thing, Robert, and here's the important takeaway from this. When we look at the, uh, uh, the census of these various types of objects, 
the Tunguska objects that can cause tremendous devastation, right? Now, remember, Tunguska blew up in the atmosphere. So the blast wave was able to spread out, right, to, to enormous distances. You know, people, people 40 and 50 miles away were knocked over by the blast wave, right? The object that hit Arizona, m most of that um, energy is now absorbed into the ground. Mm -hmm. So the radius of destruction is not as great. The energy delivery may be similar, but the, the radius of destruction, this is why when they, when they um, drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they, most people would think a bomb comes down, hits the ground and blows up. No, that's not what it did. It was deliberately set to detonate in the atmosphere so mm. that you had the greatest radius of destruction. Uh -huh. Now, keep all that in mind because here, here, here's the significant and rather ominous fact. Tunguska type objects are about 10 times more abundant than those that leave scars in the ground, like the iron objects. So in effect, what that almost suggests is that for every one object that leaves a crater, there might be five or 10 objects like Tunguska that don't leave a crater. Now, if that's the case, what that's suggesting is that celestial impacts may be way, way more frequent than previous estimates. And also then by implication, we've been damn lucky for the last couple of centuries. Yeah. But, you know, at some point our luck's gonna run out. And so are we going to be ready? Are we gonna be prepared? Are we gonna move to the next step, which would allow us to, to address that threat? Because that is a very real threat. And I can tell you this, Robert, it's, it's a much bigger threat than a small increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I know that's politically incorrect to say that, and there's no implication that we shouldn't at some point certainly lessen our impact on the planetary biosphere. But like I said earlier, my point is, is we could live in complete sustainability. We could live like our ancestors did. We could go back to farming and, and, and a nomadic existence, and we could all live in teepees and stuff, but that ain't going to stop the next rock. Yeah. When it comes yeah. hurtling out of the deep. Yeah. And, and boom, that's it. You know, and, and basically we can, you know, look at species that have existed on earth and start counting species. And we discovered that if we were to count every species that we could come up with on earth today, it's probably less than 0.001% of every species that has ever existed. In other words, we could turn it around and say that what we now know about the total number of species that goes back to the Cambrian explosion down to now, somewhere around 99.99% of them have gone extinct. And of that 99.9%, virtually all of them have gone extinct in, as a result of natural causes and the vast majority of in catastrophic events. Uh -huh. Wow. So all of this makes uh, the importance of, of history and, uh, you know, the new word I learned knowing you, geomythology, which I really love. I love that. Me too. I love that term. Uh, makes it really important. If, if, if we don't understand our past, it's really difficult to know how to navigate the future. What are the biggest priorities? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a, keen uh, advocate for uh, a vigorous space program. Um, also, uh, you know, one thing we didn't talk about at all was the, 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 the role of the sun and the evidence emerging suggesting a much more variable sun than, than people previously assumed. Also, perhaps the connection between the influx of cosmic material and the, uh, the enormous numbers of comets that are being discovered that are falling into the sun, triggering very significant responses in the solar chromosphere. CM, CMEs, uh, solar outbursts and things. We may be on the verge of, uh, you know, a whole integrated concept of a cosmic ecological system of which the earth is a part that involves um, the reservoirs of comets outside the solar system, 
the unique spacing and masses of the planets, which facilitates the influx of comets into the inner part of the solar system, a solar response, a terrestrial response to that. And this is how we need to start that we need to start thinking cosmically. And that yeah. is going to be really where we have to go um, in order to maximize our probabilities of survival and creating a sustainable civilization. Because ultimately, yeah, we do need to figure out a way to live in harmony with the earth. But interestingly, virtually everything that we dig into the earth to mine out of the earth is abundant in the very objects that threaten our existence. Yeah. And the more dangerous those objects are, the more accessible they are, because obviously the closer they come to us, the more dangerous they are. So the most dangerous objects of all in our future are also going to be the ones that are most accessible if we have the, the, the space-faring infrastructure in place, which we could do if we had the will within a decade or two. I mean, if the will was there, we, and this is why I would like to see a base on the moon, for example, and an offloading an archiving of, of all the scientific information uh, of our civilization onto the moon. I think that would be a, a, almost like the ultimate backup drive right there, you know. Um, but also the fact that we, I think, ultimately are destined to become cosmic beings. And I think every religion, uh, mainstream religion anyway, um, sort of um, has that idea. Every time I look at it, you know, Robert, every time you being a theologian with, a, with your background in theology, every time I'm out in the, driving in the country and I see a sharp steeple, I'm seeing the nose cone of a rocket. And when I look at that cross <laughs> on the top, the cross is the universal symbol for matter, the world of, of the material world here below. And I'm seeing that symbol of the terrestrial realm of matter being lifted up on the nose cone of the rocket. That's what I see. That's great. You know what I see every time I see see that? And they have them on pagodas, on masks, on yes. mosques, on and temples, everyone. They all have them. I see antennas. Yeah. And I, I, sure. yeah. I see whatever uh, prayers and whatever good intentions go into those er uh, places. They're like broadcasting energy. Um, but also a lot of those places are built on sacred sites or power places. Right, right. Which are energy spots on the earth. So I've often wondered if the pyramids around weren't some kind of, you know, Tesla electrical Wi-Fi system it's that may have helped protect the earth from these very things that we're talking about. We need a system to protect the earth from. That's a very interesting idea. And when you bring up that, you know, and you talk about the siting of, of the ancient, the locating of the ancient sacred sites, whether it's a, a, a megalithic ring circle or a Gothic cathedral, for example, or a, a, a monumental earthwork structure, there are certain traits that they all share in common. One is geometry, right? Yeah. Another is symbology. Yeah. Another is orientation. Yep. And it's invariably oriented to the sky. The third one is the, ge the fourth one is a geological component because particularly like we, we can find this true with most of the Gothic cathedrals, at least all of the ones that I've looked into and studied are all cited with respect to the uh, underground, the, the movement of underground water. Right. And when many of the ancient sacred sites were, centered around water and underground water. Um, Paul Devereaux has done really interesting work on showing the connection between the siting of ancient megalithic structures throughout the British Isles and the pattern of underground fault lines. Wow. But now, where it gets really interesting to me is that when you begin to study the structure of the lithosphere, the architecture of the lithosphere, which encompasses the um the pattern of fault lines and fractures within the earth's crust you realize that it's very likely that a lot of them maybe not all of them but a lot of those fault lines and fractures are the direct result of that 
the uh, earth. Yeah. The impact. Now, when you think and you ponder the fact that these objects are loaded with these exotic materials being delivered, being like injected into the earth's crust, their crust is now being fractured, right? Now, what happens is when you create this, this fractured zone, you create areas, lines of least resistance along which water can percolate. The underground water, this is, we're now in, down in the, the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is integrated with the lithosphere. And the hydrosphere includes not only the oceans and the rivers and the creeks, it also includes the groundwater. And the groundwater is now moving. You know, if you have a great impact, it fractures the crust, sometimes very deep. So as a result of that, magma can upflow. You have pressure relief melting that releases the magma up, and it brings up its load of exotic materials. And you've got this tremendous alchemy going on there. And then that material is being distributed throughout the lithosphere, through, through the, the lines of underground water, and where they emerge from the surface of the earth. You have your sacred wells, your sacred springs. You have the megalithic structures. You have the cathedrals built. Wow. I don't think yeah. any of that is coincidental. I think, you see, I think you're on the right path, that we're looking at remnants of an ancient system, a technological system that looks very different from our own. And, and it is for that reason that it has been hard to recognize. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're stuck in our own programming. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of stuck in our own paradigm. Yes, exactly. And, and many of the so-called skeptics say, well, what, we're not finding, you know, we, all we're finding from, say, the Clovis period is, is spear points and typical debitage and this and that. <laughs> you, know, where, you know, where's the buildings? Where are the, the hulks of cars and trains and airplanes and stuff? It's like they're almost like they're looking and expect they're, they're looking for some something that resembles our own civilization and it may not look like that at all then you throw in the fact that you've got multiple catastrophes that completely rearrange remodel renovate the surface of the earth destroy what was there before yeah now you can begin to understand why you don't really see the overt evidence of some ancient civilization from 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 thousand years ago and yet Every virtually every culture has traditions of some of, of a deep history, right? The, the the sacred registers that 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 the Egyptian priests talked to about Solon, that could be a real thing, see? But it's like you know, this this hidebound, restricted thinking of modern academia just immediately dismisses that. You know, you've got this whole coterie of these self-appointed skeptics now that think that they have the model. They have a monopoly on reality. So anybody who comes along like a Graham Hancock, it doesn't matter how well referenced his work is, they still dismiss it, see, as pseudoscience. That's their favorite term. They think that all they have to do is invoke the term pseudoscience and all of this <laughs> mass of alternative evidence that exists there will just sort of disappear and we don't have to pay any attention to it. Yeah, that's why, uh, one of the reasons why I like doing these events is there's all this mass of information sitting out there that um, the average person isn't going to do all this research to find out. It takes some really crazy guys um, to, you know, spend decades researching the material to bring it to the surface for everyone else. So, I appreciate yeah. you guys for doing all this work. And one of the reasons why I do these events is I like to bring all the like-minded people together, get the juices going, get them, get other people talking about what they know about and get the top science and the latest information out together. Um, because it seems as critical to our present and future to know the past as all the other Absolutely. Crises. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. If, if we want to have a handle on our future, we have to know the past. You know, it's kind of like this. Imagine that you have been uh, in hibernation. You wake up and you have no memory. And it's <laughs> midsummer. And you get up and it's a beautiful summer day. And next day is a beautiful summer day. And the next day is a beautiful summer day. And you think, hey, this is it. This is all that there is. <laughs> you know, it doesn't change. But you, you've lost your, you don't have memory of last winter. See? Because for whatever, you've got amnesia. That's what great, the term Graham Hancock uses that was borrowed ultimately from 
Velikovsky, which was mankind in amnesia. Uh -huh. Right, and and I think that there is a form of amnesia to which we are susceptible, and for whatever the reasons are for that, um, I think it's very real. And just as you know, perhaps there are suppressed memories. I think we mean we have suppressed memories, and I think part of the role of mythology is that mythology can be a tool for sort of bringing those repressed memories back to the surface. Yes. If 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 we if we look at them with an open mind instead of this dismissive attitude. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's getting late where you yep. are, Randall. And it is. Uh, I am so grateful uh, to spend time with you, have time to talk and do this interview for Earth Origins in May um, that you're going to be presenting at. And, you know, it, there's so I just had a flood of thoughts just listening to you talk. So I, I really appreciate it. This got my juices going. I was like, well, if that means this and this means that, oh, wow. I really enjoy, um, you know, the chance to listen to you and uh, so looking forward to having you here in Sedona in May. Oh, I'm looking forward to it too. You know, like I've told you multiple times, that area, Sedona and that area around there is one of my favorite areas. I love it out. I love it there. In fact, I, I could actually see myself perhaps relocating there at some point. Um, and you well, might point people to the uh, podcast that I'm doing. Uh, yeah, please plug that. Cosmographia.com, um, I guess. Just uh, Randall Carlson Cosmographia. The Randall Carlson podcast, Cosmographia. I think we've got 12 episodes. We spent about five or six episodes deal discussing uh, Atlantis, interestingly. Nice. Because I, I think that this is a, a subject that needs updating from what we know now. And so that's what I've attempted to do is to update our understanding of Atlantis from a, from a, from a fairly scientifically rigorous perspective. And then what we're do, discussing now is something we, we didn't talk about tonight, but we could talk about perhaps if we do this again, which is the Younger Dryas events. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Which, which Graham Hancock has written about, and um, which is probably the most critically important event that has happened since modern Homo sapiens sapiens has been walking this planet. Well, uh, thank you again so much, Randall. I'll cut this and get it out for everyone, and uh, we'll let you get some sleep for a change. And uh, again, it's always good. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, I enjoyed it too, Robert, and look forward to doing it again. Yes, definitely. All, All right, right, my friend. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.